Hello, New York. Hello, Wind Up Watch Fair attendees. Thank you so much for being here. It's day three of the Wind Up Watch Fair. I hope you're all having a fabulous time, seeing some amazing watches, and then meeting some incredible people, uh, a small sample of which we have on the stage here. My name is Blake Bettner. I am the managing editor of Worn and Wound, uh, the editorial side of the outfit that puts this show on. Can everyone hear me just fine? Don, you can hear me in the back there. Okay, okay. Great. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I'm really excited about the panel that we have here today. Uh, I've known a lot of these guys for a long time. Some of them I've, I've just recently met. Uh, they do have something in common, uh, and that is the theme of this panel, uh, the, the new British invasion, uh, a welcome invasion, if there, if there ever was such a thing, I suppose. Uh, so we're going to be talking about some of your brands. Uh, we have a pretty good representation of new old heritage base, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into all of that. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, so with that, I'm going to have uh, the panelists uh, briefly introduce themselves uh, before we get into some of the discussion here. Johnny, let's start with you down there. Cool. Okay. So uh, my name is Johnny Garrett. I am the founder of the British luxury firefighter-inspired brand William Wood Watches. So for those of you who don't know, my grandfather was called William Wood. He was a firefighter in the British fire service for over 25 years. We produce watches in dedication to him and firefighters internationally, made from genuine upcycled firefighting materials. So we take a hundred year old firefighter helmet, we melt it down, we put it inside every watch case, and our straps are made from genuine upcycled fire hose from different fire departments around the world. We've upcycled about a six Olympic size running track so far of fire hose, which is pretty cool. And we've donated over $100,000 to international firefighting charities so far. Awesome. Well, and Johnny, what are you wearing on your wrist? Uh, so I'm wearing our five-year anniversary watch. This is a bronze amethyst. It's got a, a beautiful purple sunburst dial. It's got a number five cut out of the indices. And the straps were the hardest fire hose to find in the world. It's from a Japanese fire department who uses purple. Um, so obviously, conventionally, you normally just find red. So this is a, a very, very rare watch. Very cool. Thank you. Richard. Hi there. Uh, I'm Richard from Studio Underdog, so I'm the founder, the T-boy, and everything in between, the, uh, the one-man band that is uh, Studio Underdog. Um, I'm wearing the watermelon watch on my wrist, which is, yeah, kind of what, what put me on the map. Fairly new micro brands, been around for uh, about 18 months or so, so I've been picking the brains of uh, the guests on this panel as well throughout uh, throughout the last few months as I've been building my brand and uh, yeah, so far it's been really well received and flattered to be here. Awesome, thank you. Mike? Hi, um, Mike Franz, CEO and co-founder of Christopher Ward and also the father of these three. <laughs> uh, well, at least that's what it feels like. Uh, if we're the new British invasion, I'm definitely not, I could be Mick Jagger. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Christopher Ward, um, one of the, if not the first, direct-to-consumer um, brands, some of you may know. Um, I'm also the founder of uh, the Alliance of British Watch and Clockmakers with Roger Smith, a good friend of mine. And uh, I'm wearing a C60 concept, which um, we introduced about a year ago, which uh, sold out very quickly and is uh, based on Caliber SH21 which you can see more of over there. That's about it. Yeah, beautiful, thank you. And, and yeah, just a reminder, you can see kind of the whole uh, lead up to this watch uh, in Chris Ward's uh, in the display in the back of the room here. Uh, Nicholas. Thank you, so I'm Nicholas Bowman Scargill, the fourth managing director of Fears Watches. This is iced water, not a gin and tonic. My voice is about to go, so apologize if it breaks. Um, for anyone who doesn't know about Fears, it's one of Britain's oldest watch companies. First started in 1846 in Bristol by my great-great-great-grandfather. It ran until 1976, when sadly the fourth generation decided not to continue it, and it closed down. Fast forward 39 years, I'm a watchmaker at Rolex, and I by chance discover that this watch brand is in my family's history and so decide to leave Rolex and probably the most secure job I will ever ever leave uh, to restart it and that was six years ago so 
What we try and position ourselves as today is a modern British watch company that happens to have a very extensive heritage. We focus on elegant and understated watches, mainly because I can't swim. That's why we don't do a dive watch. Um, but it's lovely to be here today, and I hope you're going to enjoy what we're going to discuss. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, from all of you. Uh, and I wanted to just kind of start out with uh, setting some terms here. We're all, you're all, all British watchmakers, watch brands. Uh, and, and I'm curious to hear from each of you what sets a British watch brand, a British watch apart from Swiss, German, French uh, watch counterparts to each of you. Uh, Nicholas, maybe we'll start with you. What does it mean to be a British watch? Okay, so I think, you know, certainly in Britain, it's very easy for us to just look back at heritage, right? And just go, oh, you know, invented the automatic winder, escapement. No, no. I think today what sets Britain apart is a couple of things. One of them is to do with design. And one of them is to do with how we go about making the watches and running our companies. So the design one is um, many years ago, Terence Conran came up with a fantastic line, which is the British design sensibility of graceful yet purposeful function. So, you know, I think if you look at, say, a lot of German watches, you can see the engineering. You can see how, quite often, the form will follow the function. I think with Britain, we, we do that, but we don't go quite a sort of Teutonic. There's always that little flourish, that little detail. And you see it in you know, British cars, not just watches. You see it in British design and clothing. But it doesn't go quite to the extreme that you might find in Italy or France. Um, the second thing is the business side. And I think that really does set us apart in that if you look around the world, not just in watches, but in lots of industries, there's something Britain does almost better than anyone else, and that's project management. So a few years ago, when they were raising the Costa Concordia, the cruise ship that capsized off the coast of Italy, the company that was in charge of writing the vessel, Australian, the people working and doing the job, Polish, the engineers on the ground managing everything, coordinating with the locals, the Italian authorities, British. And you'll see this, that something in the British mindset is going, we may not be able to do it all ourselves, but we know how to work with the people we can. And I think that's the thing you see, not just with the four of us, but with most British watch brands, is going, actually, when working with lots and lots and lots of different suppliers around the world, finding the best people to work with. I think that's something that sets us apart. That's sensible. You, are you in agreement on this, uh, Mike? Uh, completely. Everything he says, I agree with. Um, no, it's um, what sets us apart. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I think it differs by brand. Um, but the British, I think, do have, as Nicholas says, a sort of um, something about inventiveness and bravery sometimes. Um, we're prepared to take um, a different sort of a risk. Um, uh, we're kind of entrepreneurial. Um, and I think... Um, the British watch industry is in a very interesting place at the moment. Uh, it's growing. It's tiny. And we should let's state, state that up front. It's very small. Um, the Alliance recently conducted a, the first ever survey for um, ever, I think, um, which KPMG conducted for us, which tells you that the industry is only worth about 125 million at retail. Let's call it 100. No, it's 125 million at retail in dollars now, isn't it? Because of the pound. Um, so, um, so um, but it's growing very quickly, and it's because of guys like this um, that it's it's pushing forward in ways that I don't think it's ever done before. Um, but it's through inventiveness, you know, um, through that sort of um, entrepreneurial bravery that I think differentiates us uh, in some ways. Represented very well to your left, uh, of course. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'd agree with all of that. I think taking a step back from watches as well, as I think people actually just have 
an appreciation for Britain as a whole. I think if you, there is some kind of coolness, isn't there? When you approach a conversation and you're wearing a British product, you feel like you want to share the story with your, your friends or family members. If you think about even the way that the media has glamorized Britain, with we talked about this on another panel, like things like James Bond, maybe less so much Johnny English, probably not that one, or Austin Powers, um, it, it brings some kind of regalness to it. And I think that's something that you can't take away from the conversation um, because it's more of a softer element to it. Yeah, I think the, the only other thing I can add, I agree with Nicholas as well, design is a huge thing. And I think the other part is kind of brutal on like brutal honesty um so i think yeah through design through the way we communicate the storytelling the messages of our brands you know which are all very different i think each of us um share that that kind of honesty and communication no, i appreciate your thoughts uh there and mike you you alluded to this uh, a moment ago you have formalized the importance of british uh watch and clock making with the formation of the alliance of british watch and, and clock makers uh with the likes of roger smith how important is it for um for british watch brands to be united uh in their goal in moving the industry forward and, and to, into where you want it to be with the, with these surveys like where should it be where does it deserve to be well, I do think it's important that we're uh, as united as we possibly can be. We're, uh, Roger and I always felt from the beginning that we're, we're stronger together uh, than we are apart. Uh, I'm delighted now that we've got 75 um, brands. We represent probably about 95% of the British industry. It's a trade association. Um, and um, whilst small at the moment, there's something we have uh, developed which we've given a name to which is Proge Project One Billion. Um, and uh, we absolutely believe that with the way that the industry is in the UK is beginning to develop um, with, you know, upwards of 80, 85 brands, um, that a billion turnover is possible within, let's say, 10 years. Um, and when we begin to get to that size, then scale will begin to allow a supply chain to develop in the UK. Yeah. So at the moment, most of the brands, you know, Roger is a great exception to this, as everybody knows, where you know, every element of his watch is produced in his work workshop. Uh, for the most part, you know, most of the brands that are in the Alliance, whilst established in uh, the UK, source all over the world. And that's fine because you there is, no, there is no industry in the UK at the moment that we can go and buy a case from, buy a dial from, of the quality that we would all want to have. Now, and a 125 million sector doesn't allow people to invest in the UK in the right way. However, as we grow, the long-term aim is that that supply chain, that production facility begins to develop so that more and more watches ultimately will source parts that are British made. Um, that isn't the only thing, however, that the Alliance is for. The, it, we're try, it's there to promote the industry in the UK. And, you know, there are, we now have a table at um, a government, for instance. Um, you know, as, as a trade association, we're in regular conversation and fighting battles on behalf of the industry, which never happened before. One of those battles, which will affect potentially um, uh, customers in this country, for instance, the duty rates into the US um, are both complex, <laughs> to say the least, um, and, uh, and, quite, and, and can add significant amounts to. Now, we're in discussions through the British government into the US government, what can be done to either simplify or remove duty rates. Now, that conversation wouldn't have happened before the alliance was started two years ago. So it's going to be a long journey and nobody, uh, nobody sort of um, underestimates the task in hand. But it's, uh, it's because of brands like these uh, and the many others, um, you know, as I say, 75 within our, uh, within our sort of uh, association at the moment. And, you know, I think there are eight or nine brands represented here at Windup. Um, so it's not, it's growing. Uh, and uh, I think over the next 10 years, you're going to see a real, real growth spurt. I was just going to add to that. I mean, the Bellwether report 
I have to say, for me and for Fears, that was transformative because I was delighted and honoured to be asked to be one of the founding members of the Alliance. And when Mike called me up and said, we're thinking of maybe doing this sort of thing, are you interested? And I jumped, said, yes, absolutely, because we are stronger together. But also, something that, something that we have had a lot in the last few decades in the British watch industry is Britain is very good at having, you know, having people, hobbyists, in a garden shed, whittling away at a wooden spoon, running a watch company, you know, very small, very low production, no marketing, no branding. And when the Bellwether came out, I was in my office and I got a copy through in the post. And I'm sat there with a cup of tea. I was like, I'm going to sit down and read this. And I read it and suddenly realized that, you know, my small company already after a few years had grown to actually be, you know, probably in the top 10 in terms of size, in terms of number of people, number of jobs created, turnover. And that really got me thinking. And then I spoke to Mike and he, he we, you know, we were talking early doors about Project One Billion. And you're suddenly going, wow, you know, actually, if I kept my same market share, but the industry grew 10 times, that's a very significant business. And, you know, this links into something that, you know, this is why it's so great being in America. And we've all said this, you know, you land in JFK, you're getting the taxi in, and suddenly you just can sense this is a land of opportunity, but also a land that encourages people to be ambitious. To be frank, we don't necessarily have that in the UK. You know, I know we, we, over the last few days, we've all had enough pints together after the show. And we've all got stories of people basically, you know, where you've gone, you know what, I'm actually doing well. We're growing, we've done this. And people will, in the UK, knock you down for that and say you shouldn't do that. I think what the Alliance does is it gets us to look together and go, actually, we are much stronger together. But also, this is the, you know, this really is the beginning of the professionalization. You know, we, we all do something very individual, but it's us going, actually, yeah, let's get British watchmaking to actually grow. And we don't, we're not entitled to this. We have no right to it but we can do it. And I think that's the, what the Alliance is doing so well already, only two years in. Yeah. Two years. yeah. But I'd agree with everything there. I think something else, and I'm sure you'll all agree, is when you set up your own brand, it can be one of the most lonely projects ever. And thinking back six years ago, if the Alliance had been there and you could have just put a phone call in or had a, a Zoom call with somebody who was going through the same process you were going through, because otherwise it's just trial and error. Like, you're making decisions constantly on a daily basis, and unfortunately, you, you're going to make mistakes. That, that is a good thing because you learn from it, but if somebody could have told you maybe how to find a certain supplier or to help with the taxes for shipping to the States, it would have been a much easier process. So thankfully, people who are setting brands up now have that platform, which we didn't have sort of six years ago. So, yeah, so on the back of that, my brand only started 18 months ago, so I was fortunate to have that opportunity where as I was starting, I was reaching out to, to brands that, that I respected, that had done things before me, and I was so surprised how open people were to answering my questions. You know, here I am, a brand that could potentially be considered, you know, oh, is this competition? But actually everyone's been so like collaborative, wanting to work together, and I think it's down to the case where every individual brand, brand realizes that uh, a rising tide lifts all boats and so everyone works together and that's what this you know the the bellwether report showed that actually if it, you know the the opportunity is there for everyone and if we all work together you know everyone's a winner in essence yeah uh, we had the pleasure of having uh, mike and, and roger on our podcast last year i think to talk about this it's been incredible to see how it's blossomed into into something that has been benef so beneficial to so many people uh hopefully we'll get roger here next year uh over to the show and uh, exhibiting <laughs> a few a few watches of course i'm uh, sure he'd be delighted actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh so this next question i, I uh Nicholas and, and Richard, I think you are both coming from like very interesting areas, and I like the contrast between what you're both doing. Uh, maybe you can each speak to uh, you know, restarting a brand with considerable heritage, uh, as, as you have, and whole cloth, something brand new. Uh, you know, uh, what do you learn from one another? What do you envy about one another uh, in any unique challenges that you think you each face? So I guess, yeah, one of the challenges that for me that's also a blessing is 
because I have no heritage, it is a blank canvas. So every decision that I make, you know, design decision, especially in the process of bringing a product to market, I don't really have to question or, or have to try and reference something else from my back catalogue. What it allowed me to do is, is reference other, other designers that I like, other brands that, that I appreciate their ideas. So for my process, I was looking back at a lot of watches that were designed in the 50s and 60s because that's what I liked. And I was putting a modern twist on it and didn't have to question, question every sort of design decision that I was making. Um, and it was just it was just a bit of fun, and it also means now sort of going forwards, my next uh, my next designs, my next watches that I launch is is slowly helping to kind of shape the DNA as to what my brand brand can be. So it's it's a very flexible flexible process for me. So that's one thing that I that I really enjoy. I mean, it is certainly different when you've got the heritage. Um, I think I try not to think of the heritage too much, or you can be influenced by it. And because it's my family, you know, it, there is no one else in the, the Fear family is involved in the business, but they're keeping a close eye on what I'm doing with the family legacy. Um, and in fact, our new headquarters in Bristol is by chance across the road from the cemetery where all the previous managing directors are buried. <laughs> oh my God. So every, every day when I'm walking to and from work, I'm walking past them thinking, oh my goodness, they're literally looking over my shoulder. Um, so, you know, it is nice to have that. I think for me, it's going, you know, Fears ran for 130 years before it closed. Fears has to outlive me. Not just because I'm not going to have children, this is my legacy, but because, you know, I'm, I'm the custodian of the company. That's my view of it. You know, it's not being an entrepreneur, re restarting a business. It's saying, no, right now I'm fourth managing director. There has to be a fifth. There has to be a sixth. Um, now, Richard and I have known each other for quite a few years. In fact, just before he started his business, we got chatting and, you know, about different things. Um, what I like is, you know, he, it, he and I are very different uh, in terms of, you know, what we like in terms of clothing, in terms of design, um, but we're both very passionate about what we like. And that's absolutely important. But it also means that, you know, if I'm bringing out a new watch, I will often show it to him in advance to get his thoughts and opinion and his critical feedback because I admire so much of what he's done. Yesterday, I, I had one of my, my best friends come to the show to just see what I do when I'm working and we're walking around and she loved the studio underdog watches because she said it's just so original it there's nothing else like it I mean you know I, I backed the original Kickstarter campaign for studio underdog and yeah I mean they're just incredible pieces and I love them but I also love how completely British they are because they have this sort of element of irreverence that I don't think anyone else would would do or they wouldn't do it without trying too hard to make it look cool and interesting. You know, I'm, I'm a big admirer of what Richard does. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, I appreciate your, uh, both of your thoughts there. Uh, Johnny, I wanted to kind of move this over to you. You tap into a niche that represents British firefighting culture and heritage. And how important is it to represent those values uh, in that culture in your watches uh, in a way that a global audience or those of us here at the show can connect with? So we, we didn't realize going into this six years ago just how instrumental, the answer to that question, um, just how instrumental the actions that we've been putting into the industry have been. So there's a statistic which is quite scary actually, and this is, this is bad I think. We're the second highest donator now to the biggest firefighting charity in the UK after six years. Now, in my opinion, that's terrible because all of the huge corporates out there who should be supporting the fire service, where are their funds going for us to now be the biggest or the second largest donator? So we hadn't realized that we'd be making such a significant contribution back. But I think the reason that it resonates overseas is because people can connect to my story with my grandfather. So it may be that you have a first responder or a rescue service worker who is in the family and you can remember what your relationship was like with them. I think you'll all agree that our grandparents were just built differently. My grandfather was the, the biggest role model in my life, huge charismatic character, and um, some of the things that they used to have to do in the fire service back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, compared to now, is, uh, is crazy as health and safety and things have obviously have developed. 
But the beautiful thing is, is people come to our stand, even yesterday, and a guy was showing us a picture of his grandparents who was a firefighter, then his grandmother became the fire captain, and they become so intertwined within our story because they know that it's, 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 it's how you feel when you put the watch on, and that's the beautiful emotiveness of, of what we're trying to create. No, I appreciate that. Uh, and something that I think we, we've touched on just a little bit, uh, and Mike, maybe you can speak more to it, how important uh, collaboration is between your brands, not just uh, in, in ideas, but I think the know-how of all of it, uh, and, and how do you share your kind of considerable insights and experience with the likes of the people on the panel here, uh, or these kind of cards that you hold pretty close to your vest? Well, I think as, all, uh, as has already been said, I think the, um, the British brands are... Um, there's a sense of camaraderie and togetherness about them. And uh, I think Richard said, there's a sort of a, a transparency uh, amongst most of us. And so because we believe that we will all benefit from sharing stuff, um, I've discovered um, that people are more than happy to share things with us, and we are certainly more than happy to share with others. Um, and that's pretty unusual in the watch industry, it has to be said. Um, you know, Switzerland, and we uh, have an atelier in Switzerland, as you know, um, the Swiss are more closed. It's one of the distinguishing features, I think, between us and some other parts of the industry. So the, the level of collaboration, and I think it will only grow, um, is, is, is high. There's a, there's a real, I think there's the seeds of real friendship as well between a number of brands that... Uh, is just inspiring, and it's really inspiring to hear the stories of uh, of these guys as well. I mean, it's uh, it's it's there's something going on, and it's uh, it's 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 pretty impressive, I think. So, with that said, where do you see the alliance in the next five, ten years? Uh, are you optimistic about its future, especially seeing guys like this kind of come in? Well, yeah, you have to be because, as I say, these guys are inspirational. Um, we see the alliance um, growing uh, in importance. We're looking to uh, encourage education. We want more and more people to come into the watch industry, not just as watchmakers, but as the sector. The first thing we had to do was get people to realize that there is a sector called watchmaking in the UK. Yeah? The government didn't even know it existed. Yeah? So by bringing attention to it, we can encourage more and more people into the sector. Now, we are beginning to uh, create relationships with uh, institutions like the Birmingham City University, the British Horological Institute, which is largely watchmakers. But I'm keen that people in other disciplines, marketing, sales, promotion, et cetera, et cetera, that they understand that there are businesses out there now that they can enter into where there is a proper industry that you can rise through. And back to Nicholas's point, it really is important that people are ambitious. I have a slight worry bead sometimes about, there are lots of micro brands around as we know, and many of them I think sometimes can be satisfied to stay as lifestyle brands. And there's nothing wrong with that. But actually, to really grow our sector in Britain, we need more and more people to push beyond wanting to just be a micro brand. And that means taking risks, it means finding ways of getting investment in, but the first thing that you need to do is you need to want it. And so I think one of the big things that we can do is encourage people to want to grow. And that sounds ridiculous, especially sitting in America, <laughs> but actually, that is one of the key things that we're hoping to do, to encourage people to believe that they can be significant in size. So, of all the people walking around here, walking around the fair, uh, uh, mostly Americans, I presume, what's one thing that you want them to take away from your brands, your British watch brands, uh, from the show? I was going to say, you're saying mainly Americans. The first watch we sold on the stand yesterday, within 15 minutes of it opening, was to a guy from London. <laughs> no kidding, so. all right. Yeah, well, I mean, the, look at the exchange rate. It's actually better value to buy over here. <laughs> Coming over here. <laughs> but is there any takeaways that you want them to kind of understand? Like, ah, this is, I'm on board with this British Alliance thing. I think it would be good to, to I guess, see the progress. You know, this, this is my first wind up, but 
I'd imagine throughout the years the kind of the British presence is is increasing, and you know you're you're seeing kind of create more creative ideas coming through. So hopefully in the next sort of five or ten years you'll continue to to see that growth, and you know in wind ups you know in years to come there'll be new stories to tell and, and new things to talk about um, and hopefully as part of what we were saying on in the alliance in terms of opportunities and then what we can achieve here in the UK there'll be more parts being man manufactured um, and I think that'll be interesting to see as as the story develops I think just very quickly, just more creativity. Like you walk around this room, and it's it's unbelievable some of the uh, the cutting edge technology, the creativity that brands are bringing. And I think it makes you raise your game. Like I feel so inspired coming to these events because all you have to do is do one loop around, and you go home and you think, my God, you've already got ideas bubbling for future collections and ways that you can bring your your own identity and DNA um, and your own stamp to something. So I, I leave these feeling really inspired. I don't know about you guys. Uh, completely. Um, I'd like them to take some watches home with them. But um, um, the other thing I think that uh, I'd like uh, to, for, for people here to take away is uh, that you can have a dialogue with a brand. Um, I've spent a couple of hours this morning at another watch show in a different part of town. And um, it's under glass. Um, and it's the vibe is very different. And here you can talk to people you can actually have a relationship with a brand and that is very unusual in many sectors of many industries and wind up is you know without blowing smoke up your backside but is um i will do for a second it is it is one of the places where people can genuinely have dialogue with the ceos the founders the people who work in the brands and i think dialogue between customer and brand is really important and is the new dimension and I think it's only going to grow. And so that's a takeout I think you can absolutely guarantee anybody coming to here will get. Uh, so for anybody in the crowd that's curious and how they can learn more, perhaps be involved uh, in the Alliance, uh, what opportunities are there? Uh, lots of opportunities, as well as the, uh, the trade members. Um, there's a, um, you can become a club member uh, for a very small fee where uh, you, uh, it's, uh, we're a lot, we have a, um, a partnership with um, the Horological Society of New York as well, and we share things, but there are open dials where, uh, on a quarterly basis, which only club members are allowed to, uh, to attend. Um, they've all been Zoomed at the in, uh, for obvious reasons in the past couple of years. Uh, we're also about to, uh, two of us on this stand are about to launch um, sometime early next year, a collaboration. Um, Nicholas and Christopher Ward, um, where only club members can purchase what will be a very, very special watch. And that's something that we intend to do every year. All the proceeds will go to the Alliance. So Nicholas um, and, and Christopher Ward have, uh, do, are donating uh, all the proceeds, the profits of the, 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 the watch to, uh, to the Alliance. And so it's a rare opportunity. Only club members will be able to purchase these watches over a period of time. And I'm sure some people, they, you know, let's, if we go 10 years hence, there are 10 watches, that's going to be some collection. <laughs> is there uh, a website that people can check this out? There certainly is, the uh, BritishWatchmakers.com. Uh, BritishWatchmakers.com. Uh, excellent. Thank you all uh, for your thoughts here. With that, I will open it up uh, if there's any questions from the audience. Anything? Yes. If there was one thing you could change or make happen that isn't currently happening in the industry in the UK to help you through to the next level, what would it be? Have more ambition. That really is the thing. And I have to say, the last few days have just shown that to me. I, this is my third time in New York this year. And every time I'm in America, I'm just like, it is a land of opportunity. It's not just, they don't just say it in the movies. And I think that is the big contrast. And what Mike was saying about the fact that, you know, it's, it's getting brands to want to grow, want to do that. I mean, I think, I think back a few years ago and... I wouldn't say I was happy with fears being much smaller, but it was that, you know, you, there just isn't the encouragement of saying, actually, 
you could grow, you could add more jobs to the British economy, you could actually get to a point where, you know, you, 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 know, you help make this a more significant thing. I'd say it's the ambition. And, and you know, as a fellow Brit, you'll know, you know, it's, we, we've been able to have conversations in the pub over a pint here that people from the UK would be shocked because they would just go, well, you're being very arrogant, you're being far too ambitious. And, they, and they, to Americans, they wouldn't understand that. And that, you know, but I think that's the big thing. That's a really big thing. It's, it is going, we can do this. We don't, you know, we're not entitled to it, but we can do it. I would like uh, suppliers to see the opportunity of setting up, you know, maybe a case manufacturer in the UK or long, long, long term, you know, a, you know, a British movement kind of thing. Uh, but I think it takes those those stepping stones to get there one step at a time and, and to kind of yeah, show there's an opportunity there for someone to step in and, you know, and, and help to grow that industry. That's what I'd like to see. I think I'd like to see more of an education piece. So I, I'm actually coming from an ex-banker background where you'd be in Canary Wharf and you'd see everybody wearing the top three Swiss luxury watch brands. And as an independent watch company, it's so frustrating. Everybody in this event understands that there's a thriving industry here, but we make up such a tiny sliver of the, of the entire ecosystem of watchmaking. So what I'd like to see over the next five to 10 years in Britain is ways that we can educate people. And I think it's on us to tell friends, you don't have to sit on a two year waiting list or you don't have to buy a watch because of the appreciation value in the future. Buy it because you love the thing. And I think we need to see more of that in Britain uh, and around the world as well too. And I think by having maybe seminars and more events like this is, uh, is only gonna be a better thing that adds value. Maybe you wind up London someday? Oh yes. Yes. Please. That would be, that'd be great. Uh, and this gentleman here. Right. Uh, my comment is for Nick and Mike. First of all, when you talk about ambition and opportunity in America, you got to look historically about where we came from. We got from you guys. So it came from England. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure it's still there somewhere. It's just going to take some digging to get back. <laughs> it's there. But my question actually is for Richard. Uh, I noticed you, you know, you're using a single movement in your watch. How difficult was it as a startup new company to deal with China to get all that stuff set up and to get yourself situated in order to be able to produce your product? So, so I started in lockdown. So a lot of it was, you know, I, it was near on impossible. Well, it was impossible to go out there and build a, a, a personal relationship. Me personally, fortunately, I'd worked in the industry for a number of years. So I had been, I've been to Switzerland and been to, to various um, suppliers in the Far East as well. So when I started creating my concept, I, I had a few people that I, I knew to reach out to and also speaking to people like this and, and, and literally just asking the silly questions and not being afraid um, of people ignoring my emails and I'm pleasantly surprised that all of these guys were, you know, here, here to help and would give me tips as to, um, you know, how to get through. Still, still challenging. And it's taken me, you know, e even as my business has grown and I'm con continuing to order more in terms of volume, I'm a tiny little fish. Um, so, yeah, I still kind of keep plugging away at it. But, um, yeah. Thanks for the question. Great talk so far. Um, question about the industry as a whole. Do you see parallels to the British car industry? Like you've got great brands, a lot of Britishness. The world knows about them, but it's tough to run that kind of business too in terms of foreign suppliers, foreign owners, all that yeah. stuff. It's, it's a big if, issue. If I may take that. Um, yeah, I, 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 exactly. However, there is one part of the automotive industry that we lead in, which is Formula One. And if I have a personal vision in part for the industry in the UK, uh, back to this level of inventiveness that we have. I think I'd be surprised in my lifetime, maybe in these guys' lifetimes, but in my lifetime, I doubt we're really going to become a serious competitor to the Swiss industry. But I do think we can become a serious competitor in terms of new inventions. Um, you know, the last great, uh, somebody, you know, it should be said that still today, 75% of all of the key inventions in watchmaking, uh, in mechanical watchmaking, let's say, uh, came from Britain. Um, and in my own personal view, there will be some people who disagree with this, uh, the last great 
British invent uh, last great invention in watchmaking was the coaxial escapement, which was by George Daniels. Roger has now taken that on to a whole new level, by the way. And talking of Roger again, you know, at the moment he is in and has been for some considerable while in discussions with um, scientists at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. They're looking to develop an, um, a nanotechnology which, when applied to uh, anything mechanical, but including watches, would negate the need for lubrication. Now, that would transform this industry. Yeah, it would, it would transform the entire automotive industry to some extent as well. Now, that's being driven by Britain. Now, I think that's where our leadership can be. I want us to be leaders in something. If you're going to, if you're going to be really successful in the world that we live in today, you have to own something. You have to be a leader in something. And I don't think we can be the leader personally in industrialization in the next several years, let's say. But I do think that within our grasp is the potential to become leaders of technological, technological advances in watchmaking. And that's our heritage, that's our real heritage, and that's what we talk about when we talk about our inventiveness. So that's, I think, a really tangible ambition to have. Thanks. Thank you uh, for, for your question. Uh, Nicholas, Mike, Richard, Johnny, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time to, to be here, not only at Wind Up, uh, but to share your time uh, with all of us here and, and, and your insights to the industry. Thank you. Uh, let's give our panelists a round of applause.